Good morning and welcome to worship on this Transfiguration of the Lord Sunday. My name is Kim Adams and I am the pastor at First Presbyterian Church in Valparaiso, Indiana. We are delighted that you are connecting with us. Small group leaders, the session has voted to reopen the classrooms, the friendship room, and fellowship hall for your gatherings. Elder Vic Clancer will be happy to help you schedule your meetings according to the protocols that are in place. So please reach out to Vic or to the church office if your group is interested um, in meeting once again in person. Lent begins this Wednesday. A letter went out to the congregation last week with a schedule of worship, faith formation, and fellowship opportunities beginning on Ash Wednesday through Easter Sunday. If you did not receive this letter, please email churchoffice at fpcvalpo.org. Ash Wednesday is at 7 p.m. via Zoom. A link was mailed to the congregation on Friday. Again, if you did not receive it and would like to join us for worship, please contact the church office. Beginning next Sunday from 9 to 9.30 a.m., we will begin a Lenten study based on Rabbi Evan Moffick's book, what Every Christian Needs to Know About Passover. The book is not required to attend the study, and if you need a link, please contact the church office. The poetic journey continues this afternoon at 3 p.m. If you enjoy poetry and are interested in exploring faith through poetry, then come join us. If you need a link, you can contact Luann Carabell. Her contact information can be found in the bulletin. Next Sunday is the first Sunday in Lent, but it is also the Sunday the Presbyterian Church USA recognizes the work of PDA, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance. If you have a blue shirt or the blue shirt from PDA, we are asking you to wear it this week and hold up a sign showing, I serve others by, and then create your list to show acts of service and kindness within our congregation and community. Or if you have service photos, they can be included as well. Then take a picture, send it to the church office, and Elder Matthew Byerly will be compiling a video. For more information on these and other ministry opportunities, please take a look at pages 11 through 18 in your bulletin. This morning, we will celebrate the Sacrament of Holy Communion. So if you haven't already, take a moment to bring some bread, crackers, juice, wine, or whatever common elements you have with you into your sacred space so we can break bread at God's big table together. Thank you for the many ways you support First Presbyterian Church. Throughout this last year, we've had to find new ways to be in community with each other. It hasn't been easy, but through it all, we have seen the many ways God's Spirit has been at work through and within this beloved community. Please join me in expressing gratitude for today's worship leadership. Thanks to Anne, Jason, Emma, Ken, Mike and Kim, Harry, Val, Ken Cruz, Luann for providing liturgy, and who along with Ginger helped to set up the worship space for Transfiguration Sunday. In addition to Jeffrey Whitney for music and technology along with Jerry, and Sharon, our liturgists. What a blessing it is to be a diverse community with a diverse set of gifts who come together to glorify God. Now friends, please join me in the call to worship. 
Come, let us go to the holy mountain and worship Christ with the disciples. We will see Christ transformed before us. We will see our lives transformed before Christ. Come, let us go to the holy mountain and worship the Son of God. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in life inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Unresting, unhasting, and silent. Sisters and brothers, followers of the Christ, please join me in confessing our sins. He came bathed in light, dazzling and radiant. Forgive us, God, when we allow our lights to dim rather than blazing with your spirit. He came appearing with Elijah and Moses. Forgive us, God, when we try to box you in, rather than being awestruck by your power and majesty. He came while a voice was shouting, This is my beloved. Listen to him. Forgive us, God, when we listen to messages of darkness and division, rather than hearing your powerful word of hope and reconciliation. God of glory and light, forgive us when we are complacent and comfortable, keeping the riches of your love to ourselves. God of glory and light, keep calling us down from our mountain of privilege. Keep expecting more of us, your disciples. Keep reminding us to listen to your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. The brilliance of Christ's presence before us outshines the darkness of our sin. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. And now, let Christ's light shine through each of us. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Last week, we introduced our February children's song, This Little Light of Mine. And now I want to invite you all to join Harry and Emma as we sing and sign This Little Light of Mine.
Welcome to Lady Shine, Lady Shine, and all the time, Lady Shine. All around the neighborhood, I'm gonna let it shine. All around the neighborhood, I'm gonna let it shine. God is good all the time. That's right, all the time. God is good. Thanks for joining me again this morning in my messy office for our children's moment today. And thank you for singing together our children's song, This Little Light of Mine. You sounded amazing. I can hear you all the way over here at the church. And thank you to Harry and Emma for leading us in singing and signing our song this morning. Friends, let's roll up our sleeves and get ready to be creative together again today. Because we know that's one of the things that God invites us to do and to be. The inspiration for our creativity this morning comes to us from the gospel according to Mark. Where might we find Mark's gospel in the Bible? Is it in the First or Old Testament? Or do we find it in the New Testament? That's right. Mark's gospel is in the New Testament, along with three other gospel writers. Can you name the three other gospels in the New Testament? That's right! Matthew, Luke, and John also wrote Gospels that are included in the New Testament, although Mark's was most likely the first to be written. And today, Mark is telling us about a time that Jesus, Jesus took Peter and James and John high up on a mountain. And when they got there, something amazing happened. Jesus began to change right in front of them. He became transfigured, and that's why we call today Transfiguration Sunday, when we celebrate this amazing time that right before the disciples' eyes, Jesus began to change in appearance and form. He looked different. That's what we mean by transfiguration, that he changed. The definition says that he changed into something that was more beautiful in appearance and spiritual nature. Can you think of anything else in God's amazing creation that might change? Makes me think of a caterpillar that changes into a butterfly. Caterpillars sure are cute, sometimes fuzzy, but I love when they transform into beautiful butterflies. Jesus was transforming just like that and invites us to be transformed in his love as well. Now, something else happened on that mountain. Two other people appeared with Jesus, Moses and Elijah. And that might have been a little scary for the disciples who were with Jesus because both Moses and Elijah, well, they had lived a long time before Jesus and his disciples. But, God came and spoke to the disciples. And that might have scared them a little bit at first, but it also reassured them because God said this, This is my son, speaking about Jesus, the beloved. Listen to him. And we're invited to listen to Jesus as well. And when we do, we'll find that we're transformed as well. We're beautiful creatures made in God's image. And when we live our life like Jesus invites us to, we become even more beautiful. So for today's projects, friend, we are gonna in, we're going to create a little wall, or I'm sorry, window art project that will be colorful. And once we put it on a window, we'll allow some light to shine through our Jesus. So let's get started. 
It's very simple. First, we're going to take the printout that was provided at the church and online, and we're going to begin coloring. You'll see that I chose some greens and blues to color in my image. But God gave us a whole rainbow of colors. What colors do you like to use? Think about it as you color your picture. Why did you choose the colors that you're using today? After we get it all colored, and you can see on here, I chose oranges and yellows and reds because it made me feel kind of joyful and energized. That's why I chose my colors. Share with your friends at home why you chose the colors you did. So after I get it all colored, I'm going to use some scissors. And again, friends, ask for help if you need to. We want to be safe. And I'm going to begin cutting all around the oval shape and following that line all the way around. And the good thing about art is it doesn't have to be perfect. It's our own image. So once I do that, I'll end up with a shape just like this. And it will be colored all the way around here. Now my next step is to cut our Jesus figure out of the picture for right now. I like to fold over a little bit and make a snip to get me started. And then I can be trimming all the way around and cut Jesus out of the center. And after I do that, I will end up with a project like this. All of my colors in this empty or blank spot in the center. Now all I have to do, friends, is use some wax paper that you might have at home or picked up from the church. And I'm just going to tape it right here on the back. So I flip over my project and I tape it on the back. And I used like four pieces of tape and it's stuck on there. And once that was done with my colored image and my cutout and my wax paper, I have this beautiful window art that reminds me that God created all of these beautiful colors and that God's light shines through me, just like our project last week shared, but also that Jesus, who is God, shines bright. And when I put it up on the window, I can see all that light that shines through Jesus. What do you think it felt like for God to be shining through Jesus in that way? Do you think he felt warm? Did he feel excited or energized? Maybe he felt really calm. I don't know. How do you think Jesus felt? And friends, how does it feel when Jesus' light, when God's love, shines through you? Through the ways that you show your friends and family and neighbors that you love them and God loves them. How does that make you feel to let God's light shine through you? Thanks for joining me again today, friends. And as you go through your day and through your week, remember to let God's light and love always shine through you, just like it did through Jesus. Till we connect again, peace be with you. I wonder if I'll ever find my way I wonder if my life could really change at all All this earth Could all that's lost ever be found Could a God come up from this ground at all You make beautiful things You make beautiful things out of dust You make beautiful things You make beautiful things out of
all around. Hope is springing up from this old ground. Out of chaos, life is being found in Today is Transfiguration of the Lord Sunday, and today's scripture passages serve as a gift to the church as we prepare to enter into the season of Lent, beginning on Wednesday, this coming week. As glorious as this passage passages are, it is important to keep in mind that this fantas- that the fantastic vision of the transfigured Jesus follows upon the challenging prediction Jesus made concerning his own death in the preceding chapter of Mark's gospel. With open hearts and open minds, let us look and listen now to what God has to say in our first lesson from 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 12. Elijah kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. And now from the ninth chapter of Mark's gospel, verses two through nine. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. 
Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. God of shining splendor, your voice makes the earth tremble in wonder. Overshadow us with your spirit so that we may hear your word and live as faithful disciples and covenant people. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Any of us who have walked through the Lenten season in the church over the years knows that it is not a festive time, but rather a reflective one, even somber at times. It is a season having to do with the darker side of human life, with betrayal, goodbyes around the table, the Last Supper, death, a tomb, fear. But on this day, the Sunday before we enter into the contemplative season of Lent, comes this glorious passage, recounting the transfiguring, transfiguring experience the disciples had with Jesus on the mountain. A shimmer of hope of the resurrection to come at the end of our Lenten journey. And so it is indeed a gift to the church and to us. I find this passage, though, particularly daunting. Maybe I'm not alone. I'm one to follow a particular order, both in my personal life and in my vocation as a pastor. I like order. I like it when one thought follows logically upon another and everything is reasoned out in order. And here we are this morning faced with a text that defies or at least stands outside the capacities of reason. So where do we go from here? What do we do when things don't make sense to us? Where do we turn? How do we make sense of the unreasonable, something irrational or unrealistic? Some time ago, I found myself in a situation that was unexpected and less than desirable. I'm not going to go into detail about the particular circumstances, but one thing is certain. I was failing miserably trying to make sense of a conflict that made no sense to me, and I was becoming increasingly frustrated. As a last-ditched effort, I reached out to my friend and mentor, Elizabeth, who also happens to be a relative of the person I was in contention with. By the time I made the phone call, my patience had worn thin. I lost my temper and grace was nowhere to be found. I said some pretty hurtful things. By the time I got off the phone with Elizabeth, I was certain my anger and frustration had ruined our relationship. It was horrible. And to be honest, I completely would have understood if our friendship was dissolved. Not only did my frustration get the best of me, but I was also at risk of losing a cherished relationship. I was embarrassed by my behavior, ridden with guilt, overwhelmed with shame, and nobody to blame but myself. If there was any chance for our relationship to heal, I needed to be accountable for my actions to apologize face to face to Elizabeth and her family, and to prepare myself to be reconciled with the outcome, whatever it would be. Wouldn't it be great if we could just have do-overs? 
But then again, maybe it wouldn't. How would we learn if we got everything right the first time? Where, where would there be opportunities for grace? It has not been my experience that grace lends itself to the controls of humankind. Like the story of the transfiguration, grace stumbles outside the capacities of reason. So then how do we talk about such things as the transfiguration of Jesus? When our much-valued reason fails us in light of the report of an unearthly glowing brilliance and the visitation from two of Israel's most prophetic figures, like a story by Charles Dickens and a voice speaking from the clouds. When Peter struggled for the appropriate words to say, it didn't even merit a response from Jesus. Even Jesus didn't talk about it. In fact, Mark says he ordered the disciples not to talk about it until after the resurrection. And since they hadn't the faintest idea then what Easter was or what it would mean, they pretty much, as Mark says, kept the matter to themselves. Wouldn't you? I mean, Jesus didn't talk about it. The disciples were forbidden to talk about it. And here we are today, challenged to talk about it. So again, what are we supposed to do with it? Just let it stand there? Maybe. That's one option. It does speak for itself, doesn't it? The location of the high mountain tells us that some special revelation is about to happen as it recalls the commission of Moses out Mount Horeb and the bringer of commandments from Mount Sinai. The sudden and unexplained brightness of Jesus clothed in garments that glowed so brightly beyond human comprehension signaling the pouring out of God's self into human form. Elijah, the quintessential prophet of Israel, who with a solitary voice once confronted a tyrannical monarch and his false prophets. The appearance of Moses and Elijah not only exceeds what we perceive as possible, but connects Jesus in his person, to the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. I wonder what Peter, James, and John were thinking as this scene unfolded before them. Watching the transfiguration of Jesus, seeing the brilliance of his clothing, the appearance of Moses and Elijah alongside him, and then a cloud overshadows them. And it was at that very moment, there came a voice from the cloud, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Speaking words similar to those at Jesus' baptism, when the voice said, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. Except this time. The voice not only claims Jesus as God's son, but commands the disciples to listen to him. On the high mountain, apart from the world that crowded in around them, those three disciples, Peter, James, and John, not only watched what Jesus was doing, but were now called to listen to him to look and listen. And they were captivated by a glimpse of the future, a world in which Jesus is Lord. Granted, this vision came after first learning the Messiah must suffer many things and be rejected and be killed. Nothing was wrong with what the disciples had witnessed. 
They were right where they needed to be. But they didn't fully understand what they had seen or heard because they weren't ready to. Hence Peter's somewhat comedic and stammering proposal to establish three commemorative dwellings right then and there. It's good to know that even the disciples were reactionary. Jesus' transfiguration then not only recalls the heavenly voice at Jesus' baptism, but anticipates his triumphant perusia, his future visible return from heaven to raise the dead, hold the last judgment, and set up formally the glorious reign of God thus calling on the disciples to not only look at what Jesus is doing in the world around them, but to listen to him. This need to listen isn't a new theme in Mark's gospel. It emerges as early on in the parable of the sower in the fourth chapter, advising anyone with ears to hear to listen, and to pay attention to what you hear. But because they could not hear, those first disciples could not understand the first passion prediction and would not understand the second or the third, understanding that Jesus is both the Son of God, powerful agent of healing, grace, and mercy, and subject of dazzling glory and the Son of Man who will be betrayed, persecuted, and crucified isn't the easiest thing to understand. But sometimes things just don't make sense to us until after the fact. Life is like that. Life in the church is like that. Sometimes we have to drudge through the mud before we can enjoy a stroll in the meadow. Now back to the story I shared with you in the beginning, because there's bound to be somebody who's curious about the outcome. Well, three or four days later, after my phone call with Elizabeth, I was with her face to face. I named my shortcomings, apologized for my behavior and the hurtful things I said, and asked for forgiveness. These are not easy things to do. Elizabeth could have very well rejected my apology, but instead showed forgiveness. I will never forget this act of grace and mercy. In fact, from this, I've learned to respond to situations with grace and mercy, and sometimes it's harder than others. Sometimes I've had to cut off a conversation rather abruptly to avoid saying hurtful things. But these are things we ought to be working on every day. Learning to see in new ways is one of the most difficult tasks of the transformed life. Old habits, old behaviors tend to dominate us. Even as we search for new ways of living that are in closer communion with the life of the Spirit. Transfiguration is a radical way of illumination. For you see, Jesus is transfigured every day at every moment in the world around us. We might not have access to one great mountaintop experience where we encounter the transfigured Christ, but if we have the eyes to see and ears to listen, We encounter the transfigured Christ every moment of every day, individually and communally, through acts of forgiveness, acts of grace and love, and mercy and compassion. 
as we move between the extraordinary account of transfiguration and the ordinary events in our own lives, we do not need to collapse the two. But we would do well to remember that the light of God is not so hidden that we cannot see it in the ordinary. The word lives and enlivens, infuses and illuminates, even the ordinary. Amen. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for the carry. Let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. Freely you have received, freely give. Thank 
On the day of the Lord, God will make for all people a feast of rich foods and well-aged wines. The Lord will destroy the shroud that is cast over us. God will swallow up death forever and wipe away every tear. On that day, the people of God will say, This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in God's saving love. Beloved, the Lord be with you as we lift up our hearts to the Lord, our God, with thanks and praise. God of Moses and Elijah, you come to us in a whirlwind of mystery, a swirling tempest, a devouring fire, Yet you come to us, speaking faithfulness and mercy, shining light in our darkness, offering forgiveness for our sin. We praise you, O oh God, and we give you thanks for Jesus Christ, the light of the world, shining at the dawn of crea creation shining in our hearts this day with a splendor that overshadows all the beauty of heaven and earth. In his face we have seen your glory. Through his words we have heard your truth. By his living and dying and rising we have come to know the height and breadth and depth 
of your great love. With thanksgiving, we remember the bread of life taken, blessed, and broken, that we might be holy and whole. With thanksgiving, we remember the cup of salvation, your new covenant of grace poured out in love for the world. Remembering your faithfulness and mercy as we share this bread and cup, we offer ourselves in your service through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now let us share in your Holy Spirit, poured out for us upon this bread and cup. In your Spirit, make us one people, one in the promise of Moses, one in the prophecy of Elijah, one in the body of Christ. As we seek to proclaim the good news, let our lives shine with Christ's light, a blessing of joy to the living, a beacon of hope to the dying, a sign of your new creation. All this we pray to you, O God, through the gift of your spirit and in the grace of your word to the glory of your holy name. And now wherever we are, let us join our many voices together as one as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, this is the bread of life. And the cup of salvation. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Lord Jesus Christ, for the gifts of grace we have received from your hand. Now send us forth to reflect your light, proclaiming your saving death and resurrection until you come again in glory. Amen. The light of your love is shine here in the midst of the dark to shine. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free with the truth you know bring. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Say 
Beloved, look and listen. The light of God is not hidden. It shines always in the extraordinary moments and in the ordinary moments. Let us rejoice in God's brilliant presence. Now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now on this day and forevermore. Amen.